Right now is the time for the kids to come forward. Kids of all ages are invited to come up at this time. So good to see you guys. Come on up and have a seat. Come on up. All kids are welcome. Good to see you. It is so good to be together with you guys here today. I know the weather's getting a little bit chillier out. Fall is definitely here and it's downright cold. But we're glad that you're here today and this warm sanctuary. We're excited you're here because we're continuing this series called Gather and Build. If you remember last week, we've been talking about building up the foundation. And to illustrate what we're going to see in today's passage, I'm going to be honest, it doesn't go well. That God's people are discouraged and frustrated as they try to rebuild the temple. Now that the foundation is built, you think they could just build it, but no. They have these groups of people working against them. So to illustrate that, I thought of this idea. Can we see that first slide, please, Madison? How many of you ever played the classic game Jenga? Kids? Adults? How many of you ever played the classic game Jenga? It is a fantastic game. And normally, you pull out a block, right, to make sure that it doesn't fall. But how, how many of you have ever played Extreme Jenga? Really? You guys have played Extreme Jenga? I just made it up this week. How did you know how to play it? If you didn't know, extreme Jenga, instead of pulling pieces out, can we see that please, Madison? What you're going to do is you're going to take one of these blocks and very carefully place it without falling down upside. Because again, this is sort of like the foundation we've talked about in recent weeks. Now we've got to build up this structure. But in order to make it extreme, we have to first play a round of the hand slap game. Now. I don't want any of the children to get injured at this point, so any of you adults, have you ever played the hand slap? Michael, come on up here. <laughs> Michael Chandler, everybody. So, now Michael, I don't know if you've ever played Extreme Jenga, but this is how it's going to work. We're going to play the hand slap game. And so I'm going to start, and if I come up, and then if I try to slap his hand, if he pulls away, okay, we're, we're good, okay? But, if, if, if he flinches, I get to slap his hands. Now, if I miss him, he in turn gets to slap my hands, and then this is what makes it extreme. Then we each pick up a block and see who could carefully put it there. Are you ready, Michael? Okay? You want to go first, or you want me to go first? All right? All right I'm going to go. Are you ready? Oh! Slap my hands. <laughs> it's not extreme Jenga unless you really slap my hand. Oh! I didn't think he'd actually do it. All right, Michael, we, we each pick up a block. Okay? All right, so we got to carefully, you start on this side. Okay, here we go. My hands hurt so bad. Oh, okay. Ready to play again? All right, okay. so, this, so this time, let, uh, so, so you're, yeah. Okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. Oh, I flinched, I get to him, I did oh! <laughs> they're getting red, they're getting red. All right, let's do it. Okay, big, big one. I can barely hold this up, let's try it. Okay, we, it hurts so bad. Oh, okay, one more time, one more time, one more time. Keep in mind I have to play guitar in a little bit. Okay. Oh wait, no, no, so who goes, you know, I think that's good. Okay, here we go. Dude, you gotta slap my hands. Uh, no, come on, man, slap my ah! I bet you heard that in the back. Oh, thank you. Okay, you can't do it. And I certainly don't want to play with you again. You're going to smack my hand. Michael Chandler, everybody. Stay up here, Mike. This reminds me of what we're going to see in today's passage. Can we see it, please, Madison? That in today's passage, the enemies of God's people set up to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. And so in Hebrew, the verb there for discourage literally means making limp the hands of God's people. Did you see that? Kind of like how after slapping my hands several times, Michael Chandler, <laughs> I lacked the strength and desire to keep on building. And so the question for us today, kids, is this. How do we continue to gather and build when we get discouraged and afraid? So good job listening. Again, Michael, thank you for your help. I think <laughs> my hands still hurt. So you guys can grab a piece of candy before you return to your seats. If you attend preschool for first grade, you can head to rest stop with your parents' permission. Everyone else, if you could please open up your Bibles to the book of Ezra. We're going to be in chapter 4 today. Good job listening, everybody. Excellent. 
If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for being here. Normally, they don't beat up pastors on Pastor Appreciation Day. Good tie-in, Don. Thank you. But here's the thing. We've been studying this Old Testament book of Ezra, learning that for 70 years, God's people had been taken away to live in exile in Babylon. And now, the Spirit of God had moved in the prince, uh, or the king, rather, Cyrus of Persia, so that they could return to Jerusalem to gather the materials and build up a new temple. And so for the last three weeks, we've been seeing that God's people are gathering and they're getting ready to build. Last week, they built the foundation. And remember, they had a worship service, a dedication service with cymbals and trumpets. And they made this great loud praise to the Lord. And remember, I pointed out that Ezra describes how the sound of their praise was heard far away. And you remember, while they were away for 70 years, these other people groups from around the world started to move into the area of God's people that we would know as the Promised Land. And those people, those we'll call them pagan squatters, were not too happy that the Israelites from Judah and Benjamin had returned, and now they're going to build this temple. And so we see these enemies of God's people featured very clearly in today's passage. But when we talk about the enemies of God, we need to be very, very careful. I personally, if I had not received the amazing free gift of salvation that Jesus earned for me on the cross, I would be an enemy of God. And so when we look at the text, we understand that an enemy of God and his people or anyone that stands in opposition to the redemptive work of God throughout history. But what we see in today's passage is that over and over and over again, God's people know what they're supposed to do, and they're discouraged. They're beat down. They're delayed in what they know God wants them to do. And so we have to ask ourselves, we all go through discouraging seasons in our life. We all get a picture of what God wants us to do, and yet something in our life distracts us, or discourages us, or just plain stops us from being the people that God wants us to be. And so we need to ask ourselves, how are we to respond when discouragement comes? Because my football coach, one of the best things he ever said to me, and yes, it was often in the fourth quarter, he would say, you know what, team? You really tell the true character of a person in how they deal with adversity. And we're going to see that in today's passage today. So it will be up on the screen, starting with verse 1 of chapter 4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esherodon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the head of the families answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. But then these peoples, these enemies around them, set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so if you know you hit your history, you know that one of the biggest stumbling blocks for God's people in the ancient world was being faithful to what God called them to do, to follow the Ten Commandments that God had given through Moses, and to be the people they were created to be when all of their neighbors, outnumbering them, ten to one in some cases, all believed something very different. And so when we see this term in the text, enemies, what that referred to is the group of people living in what we would call the northern ten tribes of Israel. If you remember, before Judah and Benjamin, the, the southern tribes around Jerusalem, were taken away by the Babylonians, the Assyrians came. And they, when they destroyed the northern kingdom of those ten tribes, one of their philosophies of conquest is they would take people groups from all different parts of the world and they would plant them in this area so that people wouldn't have a clear identity. And one of the things they would do is they would force people to worship their gods. And so it was this very polytheistic culture. And it was these people who we would, in the New Testament, consider Samaritans that had moved into the area around Jerusalem 
while God's people were away in exile. And you remember the last couple weeks, they were able to smell those neighbors. They were to smell the burnt offerings on the altar. And last week, they were able to hear the worship team playing at the site of the foundation. And now they're upset. And yet, when they approach God's people, they don't seem upset at all. And so we see that they came to Zerubbabel, who, remember, is a descendant of King David and in the genealogy of Jesus, and all the heads of the families, and they said, let us help you build. Now again, if you needed a big job to do, wouldn't it be nice if someone came to you and says, let me help you with that. But these folks are really sneaky. They continue on, they say, like you, we seek your God. In fact, we've been sacrificing to him since the time of the Assyrians who brought us here. Now again, at first blush, you might say, wow, these aren't enemies at all. These are really nice neighbors. How should God's people respond? But if you look closer, they were very crafty, these folks. The first suggestion, their first strategy, when they say to help us build, they weren't trying to literally help them build. They were trying to influence the building project. They were hoping to get mixed in with the different carpenters and maybe cut things a little bit short or maybe pick some bad wood. Or if they were the masons, maybe they would mix the mortar a little bit kind of wrongly so that the integrity of the structure would be hindered. They were trying, in other words, to sabotage the building of God's temple. And so you think, oh, well, they're going to help. No, no, no. Their intentions were to destroy, not to help. Their second strategy, they say, look, we seek your God. Now that's true. They did worship the one true God, Yahweh, but he was just one of many different gods that these people worshiped. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to be at a Hindu temple. So when I was in college, I took a world religions and I went to the greater Hindu temple of Chicago. And as you walk in, you have a God if you need fertility issues. There is a God there. If you have financial problems, then there's a God for that. If you have crops that need to grow, then you have this God. And so maybe you're sick, then you go to this God. There's all these different gods for different things. And for these enemies, yes, they worship the one true God, but they went through the motions. But remember what God's people were commanded. You shall have no other gods before me. And so God's people have always struggled in this area. Remember, God loves diversity. He loves diversity. But God's people have struggled with this multiculturalism for centuries. Because multiculturalism says that all cultures, and therefore all gods are equally valid. And yet when we see these people saying, we worship your God, yeah, but you also worship all of those other gods. In fact, when we're, this goes on even today, when Maria and I were missionaries on the island of Guam, we taught at Guam International Christian Academy. And so we had students from all different parts of the world, but they're all claiming to be Christians. And some of my students would go to a worship service at a Christian church like we all are today. But then throughout the week, if they had another issue, they would go to their local witch doctor. And some of the churches, when I found out about this, they said, that's fine. They can go see those folks. No! You can't be having your complete allegiance to the one true God and then some of this other stuff on the side. No. And the third strategy, by saying that, hey, we've been worshiping your God since the time of the Syrians who brought us here, they're basically looking for a way of solidarity. Saying, hey, you folks from Judah, you got taken away. We, whoa, we got taken away from our homes. We're all just refugees here. We're just like you. And so again, if we were to take it at face value, it seems like a great offer that these neighbors are just trying to help. But how do you respond? Right? We all go through situations like that. Maybe they're business. Right? That you're working with one of your coworkers and you see your coworker do something unethical. How do you respond? Right? If you see them, they may say, hey, it's okay, I'm, I'm going to give you a cut. Or maybe you see your boss at your place of employment doing something illegal. And they say, you know, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You, you just pretend you didn't see that. This is just business, right? Or maybe you're at school and you see one of your classmates getting picked on. And you know that if you intervene, that bully's going to start picking on you. How do you respond? Or maybe you know someone from our faith community who's doing something just terrible out in the community, and when you question them on it, they're like, hey, that's my personal life. Don't say anything to me. How do we respond when put in situations that we need to act? 
And so we see, thankfully, in verse 3, Zerubbabel, the leader of the political side of the government, and Joshua, the high priest, and the rest of the heads of the families say, you have no part with us building in the temple of God. Why would they offer help? Because this just wasn't a shed they were building. This wasn't even a house. This was going to be the dwelling place of Almighty God. And they couldn't let these spiritually dirty people get in there and it affect what God had called them to be, right? Because we serve a holy God and He calls us to be holy as well. They say, we alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel. So they have God's authority on their side, but they also point out that King Cyrus of Persia commanded them to do it. So they have an earthly authority on their side. Now, if you've ever interacted with a bully, wouldn't it be nice if you went up to that person and said, stop doing that? They'd be like, oh, okay, thanks for pointing that out to me. <laughs> Want to be friends? No! When you stand up to a bully, what do they do? They get even more angry. And they increase the aggression. And we see that happen in today's passage. In verse 4, then the peoples around them set out to discourage. Madison, quickly see that? I think the message translation nails it. So these people, these enemies of God's people, started beating down the morale. Just like Michael Chandler was beating down as I was trying to play the game. Right? They were beating down the morale of the people of Judah, harassing them as they built. Can you imagine doing your job and you're constantly getting beat down and harassed by neighbors? It's terrible. These enemies took things even a step further. They even hired propagandists to sap their resolve. How many times in our life are we confident in knowing what God wants us to do? The path is clear. God, I'm going to do this. But then something happens to sap our resolve. We just want to give up. It's not worth it anymore. Like we all get there. I get there. Staying with the message translation now. The enemies of God's people kept this up for about 15 years throughout the lifetime of Cyrus, king of Persia, and on through the reign of Darius, king of Persia. How discouraging would that be? I mean, we get impatient when we have a bad day, right? Some of us, ah, we have bad weeks. Some of us have bad months. Some of us have bad years. Can you imagine having bad decades? This is terrible. Thank you, Madison. And so when we look at this passage, we see that throughout it, we don't have time to go through it all this morning, but if your Bibles are still open, the rest of chapter 4 is Ezra, including two letters. One, the enemies of God's people writing to the kingdom of Persia, and then those political folks writing back. And the chapter ends with verse 23. When the copy of this letter from Xerxes was read, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them by force to stop. Could you imagine you were building a house and these big bullies come up armed and say, you're going to stop right now. What would you do? What would God's people do? Thus, the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of King Darius. What were God's people going to do? They were called by God to build this temple, and yet now they've been forced to stop. As we'll see next week in chapter 5, God sends in his rescue squad, two prophets by the name of Haggai and Zechariah. And so think back to the children's illustration again. Thank you, Madison. Now again, where's Michael? Come here, dude. Now, Michael was trying to be nice, as you saw. Did you see that? Frank, can you put out your hands? I'm going to demonstrate. See, I was expecting, like, just boom! Michael's a big, strong guy. But this is what he did. Now, Grant, would you be able to play Extreme Jenga pretty much indefinitely if I just went like that? You guess, right? But if someone, a big guy like Michael, comes and just whammo! Eventually, right, your hands would get sore. They'd get sort of swollen. They'd start to turn red and maybe even broken blood vessels. Michael, thank you for not breaking any blood vessels. I do have to play guitar in a second. But the illustration is so appropriate because if you were wanting to build something and you knew God was supposed to call you to do this and you have the equipment to do that, eventually, not only do you, 
You don't have the strength, but you just don't want to anymore. Because you don't want to get hurt. And we see God's people experience that, not just as an illustration, for almost 15 years, they were beat down. They were hindered from doing what God wants them to do. Thank you, Pastor. And so we live in this world, and the, and the church in North America is wrestling this right now, that 50 to 60 years ago, most people went to church in our country because it was a thing to do. But now, fewer and fewer people make time on Sunday mornings to come to worship because most of the world says it's foolish. Maybe you have friends or family members that think it's crazy you don't get to sleep in on cold mornings like this with your comforter and instead get up and come to worship to worship this God? Who is this God? Right? We have friends, families, and neighbors that think we're nuts that we believe that there is one God and He sent His Son Jesus to save the world. Amen. They think that the Ten Commandments, oh, those are so old-fashioned. They say to us that you can't proclaim the name of Jesus because that's offensive. And yet, how do God's people respond? I'm going to be honest. Being one of God's people is hard. Being a follower of Jesus is difficult. Because you have all of these voices telling you that you're wrong. And yet, you have the voice of our Lord telling us something different. And so, Madison, we'll close here. When Jesus explained to his disciples that he would soon be turned over to the enemies of God. Now, that's important. Okay? Keep that in mind and endure tremendous suffering. This is what Jesus said. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. For in this world you will. It's not you may. It could be you may have some bad days. No, you will have trouble. But he says, take heart. For I have overcome the world. Now, may I leave that out a minute? When we see that word world in Greek, it basically describes anyone or anything that stands in direct opposition or is in open rebellion to God and His kingdom. And so those include the people that we see in today's text, but that also includes people that we interact with today. Friends, family, co-workers that just beat us up for trying to live the life that God has given us. And so how do we respond? We remember that he overcame the world, Jesus now, because he lived the perfect life and he gave his life for us on that cross. And through his death and resurrection, he defeated the powers of sin and death. We have nothing to be afraid of. And when we come against opposition, when we get discouraged, when we get beat up, we have the authority of our Lord that we can say in the name of Jesus, no, no, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to keep building up. God's kingdom here on earth. Because we know that in the name of Jesus, regardless of where we're at, when the enemy says those little lies to us, we can say, no, in the name of Jesus, not today. Because I have victory in what God has done for us. Please, pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we thank you for this great illustration in the text that for years, your people were beat down and discouraged and were afraid to continue building. Even by force, they were stopped the building process of your temple. And yet, Lord, as we're going to see that your spirit worked in powerful ways throughout that time to remind them of their need for you. And you called in your prophets. Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the perfect prophet, priest and king. Because, Lord, what you did through your perfect life, death, and resurrection is you have victory and dominion over this world. And, Lord, when, when we interact with people that beat us up, when we, we encounter enemies of our own, Lord, you call us to love our enemies and, and to bless those that persecute us. Lord, that's hard to do. And yet we know that if we can somehow figure out a way to do that, though those people that are distracting us and discouraging us that, Lord, through the work of your spirit, that they too can leave the enemy camp and join us in your kingdom. Lord, thank you for that opportunity. And, Lord, thank you for reminding us that we have victory in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.